Okay, time to get started. So uh, here's what we were talking about last time. We were talking about um, determinants, and uh, this is a, a, a really important property of determinants. It connects determinants to geometry in a way that I think is extremely compelling. And just, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, song and dance again, but again, the big reminder is that, you know, you make this algebraic construction, this matrix, um, out of a list of vectors. There's this corresponding geometric construction, this parallelopiped, right? And the related, it's extremely surprising. So determinant is the thing that does it. The, taking the determinant of that matrix tells you important information. It tells you the volume of the parallelopiped, right? No trig, no computations of lengths, which involve square roots. Um, and then even, I, arguably even more mysteriously, somehow the sign, whether it's positive or negative, tells you about this this uh, this order business, whether this listing, you know, in that order, A, B, C, is that a right-hand order or is that a left-hand order? That's uh, uh, really weird. Um, very compelling. Okay. Um, so, uh, all right, so that's about where we left off. We did an example of that. So I'm going to go on and now get to the third sort of, you know, the third main uh, object of discussion uh, in uh, in this in this section of the book, uh, the way I'm presenting it anyway, uh, is the thing that the that the section's named for, <laughs> the cross product. So finally going to get right down to writing down a definition. Here it is. Uh, with no context, no motivation, you should be somewhat um, uh, dissatisfied by this because I haven't given you any reason to believe that this is natural. Right? You remember how so when we were talking about how to add vectors, and I made this big speech about how you can't just write down a formula. You've got to give some sort of a geometric or physical justification, rationalism. What does this have to do with anything? Right? I've given you no such thing here. Right? I will, but I have not yet. So until I actually, you know, until I actually make that happen, uh, you should have a raised eyebrow uh, about this formula. Now, one nice thing about this is notice that the cross product of a vector and another vector is a vector as it feels like a product should, right? Remember, this is not true for the dot product. Dot product, two vectors is a scalar. This is weird. So this is, you know, again, sort of more, as you would expect, a vector. Um, important note, this is only defined in R3. There is no cross product in R2. And there's not really a cross product in R4 or higher. I'm going to put an asterisk on that. And if you're curious about the asterisk, I can come talk to me in office hours. There's a kind of a version, but it's, it's not really a product. But anyway. Um, so uh, as far as Math 212 is concerned, the cross product is a peculiarity of R3 specifically. Okay. All right. So we write down this formula. It's very weird. We're not at all content that this is a reasonable choice. Um, start by writing down some algebraic properties, and if you don't look carefully, it's be real easy to kind of blow past these as yawn. I know how algebra works. I learned that in middle school. Um, and then you notice, wait a minute, what is up with this minus sign? That's not supposed to be there, right? That wasn't there in uh, middle school. Why? What? How could there be a minus sign? All I did is change the order. Everybody knows three times five is five times three. What's going on here? Right. Well, this is why we have to be careful <laughs> with, when, we're, when we're writing down new operations and uh, claiming that we're just going to, you know, write down some algebraic properties. And they're obviously true, of course. Um, they don't always work out as you would expect. So heads up. Um, when you are doing the algebra of cross products, you cannot just do the, you know, all these kind of tricks and conveniences that we learned in middle school of, oh, yeah, you can kind of move things around in certain ways and reorder terms, reorder factors. We're all kind of, um, you know, uh, accustomed to those conveniences, not the cross product. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk later as to, you know, uh, why, you know, is that minus sign there? Aside from the obvious, I mean, you can just check directly. Just plug in, compute V cross W, compute W cross V. It's very clear that they're negatives of each other. Uh, but there's a, there's a, you know, once I give you a geometric interpretation of the cross product, um, I'll be able to give you a geometric interpretation of why that minus sign is here. Now this looks, again, at a casual glance like it's some sort of distributive law or something, but it's not. Again, this is a weird one. Um, this vector here that is not part of the cross product in that left expression 
is part of the cross product in that expression. This is like a weird sort of associativity or something, right? But in a weird way. I'm going to be able to give you a justification, sort of a geometrically satisfying justification for this as well. Not right now, but soon. Uh, lastly, now this one already has a geometri geometric justification. If a cross product is zero, then roughly speaking, the vectors are parallel. Uh, or, of course, it's also possible one of the vectors is the zero vector. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see this is, again, already geometric. There's the geometry right there, parallel. Okay. All right. So uh, here's another one. Oh, I, let me go ahead and zoom back out. I don't need that. Okay. Um, the cross product has this remarkable geometric property. This is one of the most important things about the cross product, by the way, is that it's always orthogonal to both of the input vectors. You give me any two vectors, their cross product is orthogonal to both of them. Very weird. Um, now, uh, that's a highly geometric statement, right? Orthogonal, basically a geometric notion. I mean, it's technically algebraic, but it's so extremely closely connected to being perpendicular. Um, and so, uh, very geometric idea and directly connected to this thing that we've only defined algebraically. So this is this is the first really big example of uh, geometric meaning that I'm giving you for the for the cross product. Um, so specifically, um, the vector and the cross product of you know whatever you cross it with always orthogonal. Now the way you check two things are orthogonal is you take the dot product and you compute and confirm that it's zero. So this is an easy result to prove. And it's strongly geometric, but it's easy to prove algebraically because we know the strong connection about orthogonality uh, and you know which is which again connects to geometry and uh, the algebra the algebraic definition of orthogonality is dot product is zero. All right, so I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you. Uh, you guys can do this uh, on your own. It's just algebra. Just do this cross, do this dot product. You got a formula for how to do a dot product. You've got a formula for how to do a cross product. Punch it up. It works. You will get zero. Uh, and then uh, likewise for um, W. If there were W instead of V, so ah, well here it is, W. Right. That dot product also zero. Okay. Neat fact. Good exercise. Everyone should do this once in their lives. Write a passage. Um, <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, all right, here's another observation. Now, this one's uh, going to start off weird. Um, shocking. Um, uh, take a look at the, these three components here inside of this formula that I pulled out of thin air uh, for the cross product. Notice that all three of those look like little two by two determinants. Right? So I'm going to uh, make that uh, uh, precise by writing down this formula for the cross product as, well, you know, in directly uh, relating to these three determinants. Now, uh, notice here I've written the vector as, uh, you know, uh, within, in parentheses, with the coordinates in parentheses. Here I'm going to write down as linear combinations of E1, E2, and E3, but they're still coordinates. Um, these are the three coordinates of that cross product. They're all determinants. Now you, you may say, "Well, uh, I, I, this was weird. Why did I, why did I put that minus sign in there? If I had just written this matrix down differently, I would not have had to deal with an unfortunate minus sign there." And that's true. Um, uh, I'm going to choose to put a minus sign in there anyway. Turns out it's not unfortunate. Turns out it's very fortunate um, because that allows me to make this observation: that not only are the components of the cross product determinants. The cross product itself, I mean, doesn't this formula that I just wrote down look a lot like the formula for a 3 by 3 determinant, right? The formula for a 3 by 3 determinant has this weirdo minus sign in it, right? And it's as if I was taking the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix, air quotes, I'll come back to that in a second, and if you just, you know, blindly punch up, you know, how would I write down this determinant? I would have, um, well, you, you know, go across the top row and cross out the rows and columns, play the game, and you would have exactly this, the cross product.
weird. Okay, now let me come back to the air quotes. Um, uh, that's not really a matrix, <laughs> right? I mean, a matrix, you're supposed to have, aren't these supposed to be numbers in a matrix? I've put an entire vector in each of three different spots where there's supposed to be only a number. So, okay, you're right. This, that's kind of garbage. Uh, but this is really convenient garbage. This is what I like to call a victimless <laughs> crime. Um, the, you can get away with this, and it, nothing really goes wrong if you write this down, and it's extremely convenient. So um, uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, by the way, this formula here, the formula for the cross product in my life, uh, I have never memorized this formula. All right? Yes? Well, like an exam, yeah. would it be okay if we solved it using uh, that method except the one that's been recorded? Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah, the, the one, yeah so that's, and that's exactly what I was getting to. I have never memorized this formula in my entire life, um, and I instead just use uh, this formula because, it's for one thing, it's really easy to remember. <laughs> Right? The nice thing about this formula, just remember that weird though it seems, just put, um, put uh, E1, E2, E3 across the top. Then whatever is your first vector, put that in the next row. Whatever is your second vector, put that in the next row. And take a determinant. So, I mean, I, again, you know, asterisk, you know, symbolically ignore the fact that it's garbage. And this garbage produces exactly the right formula. So absolutely, I'm a big believer. Yep. I think I missed it in the observation part. How mm -hmm. did you get that the middle one had it? How did I get from here to here? Or no, that the middle term had it minus. Oh, uh, I mean, if so let's just kind of go through it. Let's let's take this symbolic determinant here. And uh, so we're going to have uh, E1, which is there. And we multiply by its determin the determinant of its minor. That's there, right? Then the next term, uh, we've got uh, E2, which is there. And then we multiply by the determinant. Okay, you cross out the row and the column, and that gives you uh, uh, these four terms, uh, et cetera, right? And it's just you got to remember that when you when you do a determinant, and again we're doing a determinant here, symbolic though it may be, there's a plus minus. So plus. I got that, but how did you yeah. get from the cross product formula to the observation? Just multiply it out. This works. All right, this formula right here. That would be, that's V1W3 minus V3W1. Oh, whoops, ah, ah, minus sign. So that's actually, that. what I have here is V3W1 minus V1W3. Boom. Yep, it just, it just works. So it just file this under seemingly very weird coincidence. Yeah, and of course it's not. Not a coincidence. This all, everything coming together for you know, they rigged it up this way, right? <laughs> uh, you could take this as a motivation for writing down the formula of the cross product for what it is. Is that you know this determinant, this pre-existing notion, and if you write down exactly this formula for determinant, then look how everything just kind of fits together. All right, last observation. Uh, now, this one's uh, just a matter of kind of looking at it the right way. I claim this is a true fact. This is another really easy formula to remember because, again, uh, first vector, first row, second vector, second row, uh, third vector, third row. Super easy to remember that this little construction, if you're taking a dot product with a cross product, they call that a triple product, um, a triple product is a determinant. So that's weird. Turns out that this is a really important formula too. And let me show you where this comes from. It really kind of comes from here because uh, so you take um, uh, you know we have this cross product. The cross product's written like um, like this. The cross product has three coordinates that are there. Um, U. This other vector that I'm doing a dot product with, how do you take a dot product? Well, you take the coordinates of the green vector and you multiply them one at a time by the coordinates of the blue vector. So it's like I'm going to put uh, u1 there and u2 there and u3 there. It's like I'm just putting u's on top of e's. So that formula, the second formula turns into the third formula. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a triple product. I mean, so it's this is algebraically true. 
right? So this algebra on the left is, is the same arithmetic. I'll say it like that. The arithmetic on the left is identical to the arithmetic on the right. So anything that you know about the right side, you also know about the left side. And that's exactly why this is great, great catch. That's, a, that's exactly why this, uh, this theorem is important. We already know geometric stuff about that determinant construction. We already know geometric stuff about that dot product construction. And this is going to allow us to draw geometric insights about our brand new cross product construction. That's, that's why I like this formula so much. But anyway, this is a big deal formula. Make sure to have that memorized. Again, easy to memorize. World's easiest formula to memorize. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, now, I had you all punch this up. Or I suggested five minutes ago that you punch this up on your own. Of course, you haven't done it yet. right? But uh, again, write a passage. Everyone should do this. Take the dot product, confirm you get zero, but that's algebra. It's unsatisfying. It doesn't feel you, doesn't leave you with this, oh yeah, I see why that kind of has to be true. It's, it's one thing for something to be true. It's another thing for it to, to it really ought to be true. You know? So anyway, I feel like whenever you have an algebraic proof, you get the certainty, but you don't get the satisfaction. So here is a satisfying point of view on why the cross product really ought to be <laughs> perpendicular to the input vectors, and it goes like this. Perpendicularity, I arbitrate with the dot product. I need that dot product to be zero. Oh, wait a minute. That dot product I need to compute is my now new, you know, recently <laughs> discovered expression called a triple product, which I just showed is a determinant. Determinants, we already know, are volumes. And wait a second. What, how much volume do you get if your three vectors are, you know, V, uh, second vector, also V, right? Third vector, W. Well, uh, I mean, think about, uh, you know, here's, your, here's three vectors, and uh, if two of them are the same vector, it's, it's a flat parallelopiped. It's smushed, right? There, there's a picture of it. There's no volume inside of there. This is a cardboard box that's been smushed for recycling, right? There's no volume in there. That's kind of the point of smushing it for recycling, right? So, um, so yeah, so the volume, by this picture, the volume is zero. And then we just trace it backwards. Um, the volume is zero. Therefore, the determinant is zero. Therefore, the dot product is zero. Dot product being zero means perpendicular. No crank it out, you know, let the algebra handle the thinking for you. This is, there's basically no real algebra in this. This is a sort of a connection of ideas, which I find makes it much more satisfying. Okay, cool. Um, okay, here's another one. Y'all remember this wacky formula uh, that I uh, claim is true, but it's, again, a kind of a weird associativity sort of rule that, that somehow the dot product and the cross product, if you... If you ch if you shuffle the three the listing of the three vectors around in any one of these three ways, then uh, you keep getting the same value. Very surprising. Um, well, here's the thing: these are all, as you now recognize, triple products. Triple products are determinants. Determinants are volumes. I mean, there's a whole plus minus thing. We'll come back to the plus minus. But um, if you think about it, all three of these triple products represent volumes of the exact same parallelopiped. The parallelopiped defined by the vectors u, v, and w. If you reorder the vectors, it's still the same parallelopiped. So they have the same volume. Therefore, these determinants, therefore, these triple products all have the same magnitude, the same absolute value. Yeah? Everybody on board with that? Now, there is the question of the minus sign. How do I know these aren't sort of out of order uh, and um, uh, thus uh, have different signs? Like maybe this one's plus and this one's minus. How do I know? Well, these listings are all cycles of each other, right? Take the first one, move it around, make it the last one, and vice versa. So the orders are all cycled, so they are all of the same handedness. They might be all right-hand order. They might all be left-hand order. That I don't know, but they are certainly all the same order. And therefore, these triple products all have the same sign. These three numbers have the same magnitude, and they have the same sign. Therefore, they're the same numbers and therefore proved. 
right? So, neat fact. Now, again, you can crank that out algebraically. You know how to compute dot products and cross products, and you can work it all out tediously and know that these, these equations are true. But I feel like this gives you geometric intuition as to why this, these formulas ought to be true. And again, much more satisfying. Yeah. So if you um, traded them instead of cycled them, you still get the same nope. volume? No, nope. no. Then oh, yeah, you get the same volume because it's still the same vectors. But yet you'd have opposite, you know, you'd have opposite handedness. And so you'd, so the result would be the negatives of each other. Yep, yep. Right. Okay, um, here's a great one. This is really weird. Um, the magnitude of a cross product is equal to the area of the parallelogram that they define. Now, uh, we haven't brought up parallelograms in the context of R3 yet. And you might think, well, didn't, isn't, that the whole, isn't that determinant? No, that's two by two. If you have two vectors in two space, so two two-dimensional vectors, then yeah, make a matrix, take the determinant, yes, right. These are two vectors in three-dimensional space. Remember, cross product is a peculiarity of R3. So we have not brought up parallelograms at all. And yet, here's a uh, true uh, fact, again, relating algebra to geometry. Um, the magnitude of the cross product gives you the area of the parallelogram. Um, I'm going to show you um, my favorite proof of this fact. That's what I like to call a mathematical bank shot. We're going to get to something that we're interested in by starting in a totally different direction. right? We're interested in that and this, so we're going to start off by considering neither one of them. <laughs> right? I want to get from here to there. Okay, we're going to go that way. Right? So does everybody see what I mean by a bank shot? I don't know if you all do billiards, pool, that kind of thing. Anyway, if you don't, if you don't get the metaphor, it's just a joke, nothing to worry about. Um, okay, so, but it, it works out really nicely, so uh, follow me on this. Uh, it seems weird. Why would I consider this thing that is neither of the objects I care about? Okay, bear with me. On the first hand, it's a determinant. Determinants are triple products. First vector, second vector, third vector. That's a triple product. Determinants are triple products. We already know that. Okay, well now, yeah, but now look at this a little bit more carefully. This is a triple product, but it also ended up being a dot product of a vector with itself, and that's magnitude squared. Right? Okay. All right, now, other thing I know about this expression. It's a determinant. Determinants are volumes. We already know that. It's the volume of this thing that you get when you take the cross product and then V uh, and then uh, W. Oh, I didn't. Okay, sorry. So what's the volume of this parallelopiped? Okay, well, here's the thing. that The volume of that parallelopiped is actually fairly easy to write down. Uh, this, uh, let's see here. Do this with you. This volume, this is a geometric figure that you all all saw in high school. Right? It's a, it's a kind of a cylinder. Um, in the sense that we've got this shape down here that it has been now dragged perpendicular to itself to make a solid. And when you drag an area perpendicular to itself, you generate a, well, again, it's, in general we call it a cylinder. It's a, not a circular cylinder, but it's a cylinder. And height, you might call it, times the area of the base is that formula for that volume. Everybody remember that formula from high school geometry way back when? Okay. All right. So uh, we have successfully computed something I don't care about twice. <laughs> okay. So, and it's all about to come together. So this thing that I don't care about is equal to that. This thing that I don't care about is equal to this. Therefore, these two things are equal to each other. Cancel one common factor. And that formula turns into this formula, which is what we wanted to prove. Here we see how that works yet. Um, is it a parallel piped? Like, not. Is it the cross, like, the side of the shape? Like, I know cross product is supposed to be perpendicular to V and 
W, uh -huh. but is it yep. the shape of a like the actual like thing supposed to be like diagonal since it's like a parallelogram on one side? Um, not sure I understand your question. So, so, so the point that I was taking advantage of here is that if you look at both of these vectors, v and w, and therefore also their entire parallelogram, uh, they're perpendicular to their cross product, and that makes this a perpendicular because we've got these perpendicularities. Uh, you know, that's perpendicular to that. It's perpendicular to that. So, I mean, I've got it tilted to the side just to show that it, you know it could be. I don't know how this is oriented exactly, but the what I'm calling the height in purple is perpendicular to the what I'm calling the base in green, so it's a cylinder. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Um, so like, if you wanted to calculate the area of a parallelogram and you were given 2D vectors, could you just add a zero for like the Z component and then yeah. cross product them? You, you can. Um, now, I'll, I'll note that if you have two two-dimensional vectors, we already have a formula for that right. parallelogram. It's just determinant. But yeah, if you want to like say, I'm going to embed these two-dimensional vectors into three space and view them as three-dimensional vectors as you described and then use the cross product formula, totally, you'll get exactly the same answer. In fact, that cross product of those two vectors will just be this vector going straight up, um, depending, well, up or down, depending on which way you order them, right? Um, and uh, with, the, with the correct magnitude, totally. Yep? So can you go through again how to relate the two equations and like yeah, so, so uh, if, if something is equal to two different things, those two different things must equal to each other. That's, that's so structurally. So this is equal to that, right? This is also equal to that. And therefore, I mean, if this, I mean, let me color. If this is equal to that, and if that's equal to this, then by transitivity, whoops, by transitivity, uh, this is equal to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. This is a cool proof. I like it. Um, okay. So, by the way, this allows, this gives us, again, a geometrically satisfying way to view. This was one of the first algebraic things that we wrote down about the cross product. If the cross product is zero, then the vectors are parallel, or one of the vectors is the zero vector. And really easy to see why this is true at this point. Both of these statements are easily relatable to this statement. Right? Not at all hard to persuade yourself that this is an if and only if. The area is the magnitude of the cross product. So if the area is zero, the magnitude of the cross product is zero. That means the cross product is zero. It's the only vector whose magnitude is zero. Okay? And again, geometrically, this is very satisfying. And how else can you have a parallelogram whose area is zero. It's going to either have to, one of the vectors is the zero vector or the two vectors are parallel. So, neat fact. Okay, so uh, now we have what I'm going to call almost a complete geometric uh, description of the cross product. The cross product is a vector whose magnitude I can describe the magnitude of the cross product geometrically. The magnitude of the cross product is the, the uh, area of the parallelogram. I can describe most of the direction of the cross product geometrically. Um, it's the direction perpendicular to the two input vectors. That's, that's all geometric talk, right? But I will point out, I'm going to have to admit, that uh, that does leave open uh, the ambiguity. I mean, sure, uh, this area tells me which, you know, what the magnitude is, and I know it's got to be perpendicular, uh, and therefore along this line, but I don't know, is it that way or is it that way? Right? So it's tempting to say, oh, yeah, you know, the, the geometric point of view on the cross product. It's perpendicular and of a geometrically determined magnitude, but then how do you resolve the direction? And uh, there's a great way to do that. And again, it comes from something we've already written down. We wrote this down previously. For other purposes, squares are never negative, right? Therefore, this determinant is never negative. It's usually positive. I suppose it might be zero. The zero is kind of a sort of trivial case. Um, positive determinant means that that listing is a right-hand order, right? 
And uh, it's a little bit more convenient to cycle these and, you know, take the first one, move it to the last position. A little bit more convenient to view it as these vectors are in right-hand order. So um, this is what a lot of people call the right-hand rule. This is one of several right-hand rules. Um, but uh, if you want to know which way the cross product points, index finger along the first vector, middle finger along the second vector. Again, no hand yoga, right? Um, and then your thumb will point in the direction of the cross product. Now, the cross product is perpendicular to these two. But the point is it's perpendicular in the direction indicated by the, by the right-hand rule. Okay. All right. Okay, so this here is a complete geometric characterization of the cross product. And I've seen presentations of the cross product that start with this. Remember, I was making fun of myself earlier saying, oh, I'm, you know, I've made this big deal about how the, you know, geometric perspectives are important. You've got to start with geometry. And I didn't do that. I wrote down a formula. Shame on me, right? So with that uh, shame in mind, uh, again, a lot of presentations of the cross product will start with, okay, here's, here's a geometric point of view on the cross product. And then you can just work backwards, kind of, and derive the formula. I just think that's weirder uh, algebraically, <laughs> so I, I prefer to just ask y'all to have a you know trust me for 30 minutes while we get to this. Uh, but anyway, this is the way you, geometrically you think about the cross product. Okay, all right. It's the unique vector that's perpendicular to the inputs. The area tells you the magnitude, and it creates a right hand. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, why is this true? You remember we wrote this down. This is uh, peculiar. Why does the cross product, uh, why do you get a minus sign if you do it the other direction? So I give you a couple of, uh, um, couple of different points of view on this. This one's a little bit more sort of bulletproof, but I, I really have a preference for the sort of the hand wavy approach to answering this question. We have this geometric characterization now. First vector, second vector, thumb is the cross product. What happens if you change the order of these two vectors? If that's no longer first, and this is no if, if this is first and that's second, there you get that. That's your picture, and notice your thumb just flips over to the other side. All right? Everybody happy? Okay. All right. Okay. And there's an example. Um, that, this is kind of a fun example. Do this one. Let's compute this cross product without using a formula. All right, let's use just our understanding of geometry to conclude what this is. Well, uh, I know, just by perpendicularity, I know it's got to be in the E2 direction. The E2 direction is the only direction perpendicular to E1 and E3. I don't know which way. Is it that way or that way? I don't know. It's, uh, how long is it uh, yet to be determined? Um, these two vectors make a parallelogram that's a square it's the unit square in what you might call the XZ plane. And uh, the length is pretty, I mean, so the area is pretty clearly one, and therefore the length is one. So I've got a vector of length one that's pointing in the E2 direction. I've almost got it figured out at this point. It's either E2 or negative E2. Right. And then uh, lastly, uh, just notice that, again, you just got to play the hand-waving game, but... Uh, Play the hand waving game, and you can see your thumb will point in the E2 direction. So the answer is E2. Purely geometric argument. Okay. All right. Okay, moving along to lines and planes. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Okay. All right, so um, let's see here. Uh, I think there's no chance that we're going to finish this lines and planes section today. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just announce for your for your um, uh, planning purposes that you know you, I encourage you to go ahead and start working on the cross product and determinant uh, exercises on the syllabus. Those will definitely be due on Friday. Um, we will certainly finish lines and planes on Wednesday. Beyond that, I'm not sure. We might go we might make it further, uh, but uh, we won't finish it today. So you're probably not going to be quite ready to start those exercises today. All right, but cross product and determinant. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, now y'all know about the equation of a shape. Y'all talked about, you know, the equations of curves. This, is kind of, this goes all the way back to middle school. What's the equation of a line? What's the equation of a parabola? Blah, blah, blah. 
right? Okay, so I just want to sort of explain where that terminology comes from, the equation of a shape. And so, so here's the idea. It's a test. It's what I like to call a test. You take a point with its coordinates x and y, whatever your coordinates are. Um, if you plug that into the equation, and if the equation works, then it is on the shape. If the equation does not work, that point is not on your shape. Right? So, so, so it's very much a test. It's a point tester. You got to come to me with the point and say, "Hey, here's a point. Is that point on the shape?" I test it with the equation, and it either is or it isn't. Okay. Not all of the algebra that we're going to write down to understand shapes will have this feature. In a few minutes, we're going to write down some algebra. Maybe Wednesday, but we're going to write down some algebra very soon that is not a test. It relates to the shape in a different way. Okay. So I wanted to get the uh, sort of the, the the context right here first. Okay. Um, all right, so y'all remember, this is a flashback to middle school. Everybody remember that? Okay, so this was uh, my favorite formula, you know, equation of a line from middle school. Uh, I didn't really care for this one so much. I felt like this was like, well, what's the purpose of this one on the right here? Um, the one on the left, I know what M is. M relates to slope. Right, K relates to the intercept. The equation on the left tells me things geometrically. It's got geometric meaning that you can read straight off of it. I like that. Right? Where's the geometric meaning here? Uh, my opinion in middle school, my assumption was that people just like this formula because, well, it's organized. We've got all the variables on the left, constant on the right, right? It's like a clean room or something. I don't know. Uh, it's, I just didn't know anything. No one ever told me anything about there being anything geometrically natural about this. Right. Okay. All right, so I didn't care for it. All right, now I want to consider a uh, question. Here's a reasonable question. Suppose we have a line that we want to understand, and I'm going to tell you two things about this line. I'm going to first, I'm going to tell you a vector perpendicular to the line. I'm going to call it N. Tell you why in a few minutes. Um, a comma b. And uh, now I'm going to tell you another thing uh, about this line: that this line goes through this point x naught. All right. So if I if I were to tell you an n and an x naught, that, that completely characterizes the line, right? If you, you give me an n and an x naught, there is only one line. In fact, there is exactly one line that's perpendicular to that n vector and that goes through this x naught vector. Right. So these two objects, x0 and n, could be thought of as a way, however weird it may seem, a way to characterize the line. All right, so with that information, how would I then create an equation of the line? Like what would the equation of this line look like? You know, given an n, given an x0, what is the equation of that resulting line? Okay, well... How do we write down a test? Well, here's the, the first observation I'll make. Uh, if you give me a point that is on the line, notice that x minus x naught is parallel to the line. Everybody see that? Okay, next observation. Hypothetically, let's suppose x were not on the line. Well, then x minus x naught would not be parallel to the line. So this might seem a little silly, but whether or not x minus x naught is parallel to the line is equivalent to the question of whether or not x is on the line. Yeah? Okay. Okay, well, on the line equivalent to this difference parallel to the line. Now don't forget, uh, oops. Parallel to the line means perpendicular to the normal vector. Oh, excuse me, to the n vector. Right. Very conveniently, perpendicular means dot product is equal to zero. Now I've got this written algebraically. And again, you know, we love geometry. The real world looks like geometry. Geometry is our way of connecting the physical world. Uh, but algebra is where you get work done. 
<laughs> right? So, um, so that's why we that's why we do algebra is because it's something where we, we have you know uh, algebraic properties, algebraic you know you can do algebra as they say, and uh, and you know with too much to great effect. So now we're in the world of algebra, and um, I'm going to use algebra to get down to this, and then notice that I uh, go back up to here and uh, in dot x ax plus by right and then uh, now in dot x naught what, what is in dot x naught well look in was given x naught was given the, the, what's on the right doesn't have anything to do with with uh, the unknowns x and y that's just stuff that's given so dot it out you get some number call it c right that's some number and uh, look what you got here. You got your equation of a line that I that I did not appreciate in middle school. X plus B, Y is equal to C. Yeah? Okay, and you might say, well, look, I already knew that this was the equation of a line. Why am I supposed to be impressed by this? The reason you're supposed to be impressed by this is because now we've got something kind of like this. You remember I was, I was psyched about the fact that M tells me the slope. From the algebra, I can read and infer geometry. We now have something like that for this equation. Specifically, when you have this equation, these numbers, the coefficients of x and y, those numbers that I'm calling a and b, those numbers uh, whoops, give you the vector perpendicular to the line, or a vector perpendicular to the line. That's geometrically natural. Everybody on board? So it's a different kind of geometry. Now, they can't tell you this in middle school. They can't say, yeah, this is slope, and this is the intercept, and this is, relates to this thing called the dot product that y'all haven't learned about yet, right? So that's why they can't tell you in middle school. But now that we know dot products, we see that, hey, this these coefficients here are telling you something geometrically important. Those are telling you... Uh, a uh, perpendicular vector. And by the way, I've, I've inadvertently slipped up a couple times already, and I said normal vector, and I didn't mean to do that. But that's why I called this the n. Um, uh, n is for normal. And normal is a word that mathematicians sometimes use to suggest perpendicularity. That's one of the several meanings of the word normal. In, in the context of Math 212, that's, what, uh, that's one of two meanings of normal that's going to come up in, in Math 212. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, so why are we doing this? Is this a, uh, uh, want to make sure to firm up your, your middle school math skills? <laughs> uh, no. Um, so a oh, quick example, easy example. Uh, let's find the equation of the line that goes through these two points. Well, that means I, 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 mean, I can take their difference. Now I have a vector parallel to the line. That means this is a vector perpendicular to the line. And once you have a perpendicular vector, call that your n. And that gives you your equation of the line with dot product. So it's a you know, easy calculation um, example. Uh, I do want to show you one thing. I pulled a fast one here. I used a parallel vector to deduce a perpendicular vector. Um, this is a neat fact, but uh, if you think about it, if you take any vector in two dimensions, if you just flip the coordinates and put a minus sign on either one of them, check it out, that dot product is obviously zero. Right? A comma B and B comma negative A, that dot product is always zero. So that said differently, this little switch and stick a minus sign on it is a little hack for creating perpendicular vectors. Pretty useful pretty often, so that's a, a good trick to remember. Okay. All right, so again, uh, our purpose here was not to solidify your middle school math uh, under understanding. Uh, that calculation we just did is a segue into a new thing, which is how do we write down the equation of a plane in R3? And it's surprisingly analogous. Um, first, let me persuade you that a vector perpendicular to the plane and a point in the plane completely characterizes that plane, right? If you say, ah, I'm thinking about a plane that goes through that point and is perpendicular to that end vector, that 
entirely characterize the plane. There is only one such plane. In fact, there is always exactly one such plane. Yeah. So geometric characterization. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so I'm just saying if you tell me uh, I'm talking about a plane that goes through this point x naught, and that this plane is perpendicular to the in vector. I mean, once I know a vector perpendicular to the plane, then I know what I'm going to loosely call the orientation of that plane, right? It's got to be, I mean, it's perpendicular to this, so it's got to be kind of this way. And then if it's got to go through this point, uh, I, I'm nailed down at this point, right? I can't twist it because that'll mess up the normal vector, and I can't translate it because then it won't go through the point anymore. There's exactly one plane that's perpendicular to n and goes through x naught. Right. Play the same game. Um, this point is in the plane if and only if that difference is parallel to the plane, which is if and only if these vectors are perpendicular, which is if and only if that dot product is zero, which allows you to do some algebra, which allows you to get down to this, which if you, you know, look back and say, okay, our normal vector n uh, has uh, coordinates a, b, and c. So this n, a, b, c. Um, our x vector here, x, y, z, there's the dot product. And we get this pretty analogous looking equation. So there's the equation of a plane in R3. And again, the same interpretation, the coefficients on the left, the coefficients of the variables gives you the coordinates of the normal vector. And that's not middle school, right? Probably. Maybe you went to world's best middle school. Okay. 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 All right, so um, important idea. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's find uh, the equation of a plane that goes through three given points. So here's the three points, um, P, Q, and R. Uh, clearly, there's a unique plane that goes through those points. And how would I find the equation of that plane? Well, oh, okay, the equation of that plane. Well, I need to find a normal vector. I need to find a vector that's perpendicular to that plane. Here's the trick. Um, I did not think of this on my own the first time. Somebody showed me this trick. Very handy. Um, the trick is observe that if these three points are in the plane, their differences are parallel to the plane. If two vectors are parallel to the plane, their cross product being perpendicular to both of them is perpendicular to the plane. I can choose to make that my normal vector. That's a choice. Come up with, I can label anything that I want to as n, and it satisfies the rule that it's got to be perpendicular to the plane, so I'm calling it in. Yeah, everybody happy? Once you have a once you have your normal vector, it's all downhill uh, from there. Uh, that normal vector tells you your a, your b, and your c. It also tells you the thing that you have to dot with your x naught to get your d. Where's my x naught? Well, my x naught can be uh, well. It's any any vector that's in the, or excuse me, any point that's in the plane, I have three to choose from. Pick your favorite one. It doesn't matter. They're all going to give you the same value. And I, I tend to pick the one that has the easiest numbers in it. I like zero. I don't know. Personal preferences, I like zero because the arithmetic's easy. Right? So look for whichever one's going to make the arithmetic the easiest. Call that your x naught, and that'll tell you your, uh, whoop, that'll tell you your, your right-hand side. I guess I didn't write down the rest of it. Everybody happy? All right, we're making good time. Um, okay, let's see here. I'll tell you what, uh, we're not going to make it far enough into the next thing. I've only got 50 seconds left. I, I feel like I probably owe y'all an early stop since we've done late stops. So we'll call it a day here. See y'all later. Have a good